All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to uh, all of us here at Birch Aquarium. Um, my name is Caitlin, and we have a very special guest this morning, Melissa, who is a new face. We haven't had her on yet for an Aquarius chat, but I'm so excited to talk to Melissa because she does a lot of really, really cool stuff at Birch Aquarium. Um, so before we dive in, haha, I wanted to say welcome to the Qualcomm families who are tuning in today. Thank you to Qualcomm for supporting Birch Aquarium, and thank you for tuning in. Um, we're really excited to share a behind-the-scenes look at Melissa's really neat career and the insider scoop at what it takes to be a scuba diver and also to take care of one of our largest exhibits, the giant kelp forest. Now, our kelp cam is still temporarily down. The red tide is still happening here in San Diego and the exhibit though a little bit more clear is is definitely still cloudy so um, we are going to be looking at some really fun photos uh, that Melissa sent us and some fun images of different animals and maybe some other animals that you haven't seen before so anyway good morning good morning and Melissa welcome can you tell us a little bit about what your job is at Birch Aquarium yeah, sure. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for tuning in today. Uh, my name is Melissa. I am the dive assistant aquarium dive safety officer here. So I'm in charge of all dive safety here at the aquarium, as well as dive training and making sure that all exhibits are getting dove on a proper schedule. And then I also get to take care of the largest exhibit we have here, our giant kelp tank, as well as the smallest exhibits we have here, our nursery tanks. So it's really fun to be able to watch some of these animals grow from teeny tiny babies and care for them and then get to care for them again when they're large adults. It's so cool. And I know that um, our giant kelp forest and the nursery exhibits are two of the most popular ones at the aquarium. And I know when when we are able to head back, I know you were there right now, um, but when the rest of us are able to finally visit Birch Aquarium again, I know that for me, the nursery exhibit is gonna be one of the first ones I go to because I can't wait to see how much those babies have grown over the last few months. Yeah, quite a lot. And they miss you guys as much as we all miss them. Yeah, and, and as as we've mentioned in a few of these chats before, uh, we have essential staff working at the aquarium right now, and Melissa is part of that essential staff, taking care of the creatures, making sure all of the exhibits are running appropriately uh, while the rest of us are working from home. Now, M Mel, you're in a location that's slightly different than some of our other locations <laughs> that we've had that we've chatted with our aquarists. Where are you right now? If you guys all notice, I definitely don't have a desk around me or anything else that looks normal. I have a neoprene gloves and a regulator and all the wooden things you see behind me are actually dive lockers. I am currently in our Birch Aquarium dive locker room. Um, I have a desk up here since I am the dive safety officer at the aquarium. And I get to sit up here where everybody stores their gear to get into these tanks and go diving. Is it ever stinky up there from the wetsuits? The time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But it's nice and sunny and pretty, and I don't mind the stinkiness because it's the story of my life when it comes to neoprene. That's true, right? I also think you have one of the most beautiful views at the aquarium because um, we've mentioned a few times that the top of our giant kelp forest exhibit is open air. And so from where Melissa is sitting, she can sometimes, maybe if you peek out the door, do you have an ocean view? I do kind of have a horizon ocean view with the way that the roof comes up. You can't see the beach or the waves or anything, but it is still very nice to be able to walk outside and just be able to see the, the beach or the ocean and be in the sunshine and get some nice vitamin D. So it's kind of like a penthouse view, just with a little bit. <laughs> That's awesome. Well. Melissa, your career and your position at the aquarium is a really neat one. As I mentioned, you are our pro scuba diver for the aquarium and you're in charge of making sure that not only is our team being safe, but coordinating all of the equipment and then also helping with the Scripps Oceanography scientific diving class and program, which is a lot of work, I'm sure. Um, we have a really fun video here. So as I start to play that, can you tell us a little bit uh, more about how, how did you end up in this cool career? Well, uh, you know, as most when you're younger, you have an idea of what you want to do in your life. And I actually wanted to be an astronaut. So I went to space camp and I decided I wanted to go up to space and then I realized that you have to do a lot of math to go to space and I wasn't so good at the time. So um, luckily at space camp was the very first time I ever went scuba diving because they want you to feel the weightlessness of being in space. 
cool. Uh, so that kind of sparked my interest in the new direction. And growing up in Oceanside, uh, California, right by the beach, uh, really got me excited about the ocean, the life in the ocean, and moving forward with trying to be underneath it and scuba dive. So I went to Humboldt State University up in Northern California, where I got a major uh, biology degree in uh, marine biology, in emphasis of fisheries biology, and I minored in scientific scuba diving. So I came out of college with a AAUS scientific scuba diving degree that allowed me to go help other researchers do research underwater. That's so amazing. Melissa, I actually didn't know that. I'm really excited to learn that. What a cool career path that you set yourself on from an early age. There's many people who aren't sure what they want to do when they're younger. So that's really, really cool. It's been really fun. And then I got lucky enough to become a dive instructor um, after college. And I continued to teach diving to children as well as adults. And I was lucky enough to become one of three co-instructors for the Scripps Institution of Oceanography's Scientific Dive Class. So. so cool. Now, I know that uh, we have mentioned the dive class here before, and it's it's surprising to a lot of people that scientists need to learn how to scuba dive safely when they're doing the research. Now, please keep in mind that every marine scientist needs to scuba dive to do their research. There are so many different career paths that you can go on, um, but also there are some pretty cool other disciplines that, that need to scuba dive, everything from geologists to chemists to all sorts of it. So Melissa, can you tell us a little bit more about what is that dive class like and what's it like to teach all of these different scientists how to scuba dive and do their research underwater? Exactly, Caitlin. We have so many different people coming in with so many different backgrounds as well as so many different options of what they're gonna do moving forward that it's really hard for us to try to hit every nail on the head. So the main point of our dive class is safety, teaching divers that already know how to dive for the most part to be extra safe while then now taking their focus off of their normal diving activities to moving towards taking data or scientific research underwater and keeping that safety as a paramount access of what they're doing. So mainly what we're doing is just making sure that the skills that they have as scuba divers are spot on and then just rescues, 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 here's rescues, learn how to rescues. Now that you've thought about all that and that's all hammered into your head, let's learn how to do some science. There you go. We do move on and teach them how to do transects underwater, like laying out a measuring tape and going to certain parts along the measuring tape and taking samples. We teach people even how to stay off the bottom while writing down the information they have because thinking about your buoyancy is one way to really keep your buoyancy spot on. But when you start to focus on different things, you start to breathe differently, you start to think differently, and your body starts to react to that. So that's something else that helps people to practice and do that in our dive class. Um, so we do everything from collecting data and writing it on slates to taking underwater photos of certain things at times to teaching them how to do other uh, types of coming up into the water column samples and data collections. How cool. It seems like in order to be a good scientific scuba diver, you need to be really good at multitasking. Safety should be paramount and focus should always be able to come back to that, but multitasking is the key. Definitely. Wow, that's super cool. Were you ever surprised by some of the types of research that the scientists said they wanted to do underwater? Oh yeah, there's been some very interesting uh, ones coming through. Everything from people doing the coral mosaicing for the coral reef uh, restorations and seeing what's happening to coral reefs to underwater cenote diving in the caves in Mexico and doing archaeological digs and discoveries there all the way to the Haifa um, Archaeological Institute in Israel. We work with a lot of those students as well that are devising not only archaeological digs over there, but coming up with areas locally where we've discovered some areas that we want to do some archaeological underwater digging as well. That's so cool. People don't realize that Scripps Oceanography actually has a center for marine archaeology, and there is a ton of archaeology that's done underwater since sea levels change over the hundreds to thousands of years. So that's super cool. Um, Melissa, I see we have a picture pulled up right now of you on one of the dive boats getting launched from Scripps Pier. Is that cool getting to, to work with all sorts of different equipment? It is really neat. Coming here, I had the opportunity to have already known how to drive a boat, so that was really neat. But I've always driven a boat who was already on a mooring in the water or being launched off of a truck on a dock. So this is something that was super interesting to me because these boats are 
picked up by a crane over the edge of the pier and then lowered it down into the water like that. And then you climb down a separate ladder, hop into the boat and then drive away to do whatever collections or researches you need to do. So it was a really fun way for me to learn to launch a boat a different way. And it's a really interesting day when you get to go out there because now you have to think about where things are level in the boat, how the boat is sitting mid air when you're gonna lower it, what's the wind doing, what's the currents doing, what's happening. And there's a lot more that you have to think about when doing this, but it's well worth it. Definitely. And and those scripts Pier is closed to the general public. If anybody is down at La Jolla Shores Beach and you see the crane kind of moving around and people milling around on the pier, keep an eye out and look from the beach because you might see people like Melissa or other Scripps Oceanography researchers launching boats to go do some research. Uh, it looks like we have a lot of questions and comments um, coming in. We have a lot of questions about animals. I see that there are some kids in TK who are watching today, and they have some questions about um, some of our animals. And I just want to let you guys know, we're going to talk about animals in just a few more minutes. Um, but we did get a few questions about um, diving. So um, one person wants to know, where do you teach the diving class? Where do you teach the scientific diving? We actually teach it locally right here at Scripps. We use one of the swimming pools up on UCSD's campus to do our pool sessions. And then we do majority of the diving right here off the Scripps Pier. We will set floats for ourselves to have the areas that we need and we'll teach it there. And then when we need, do start moving into doing the research, we'll go offshore and use these boats to transport the students as you saw in a previous picture. And we'll head out to the kelp forest off of the cove area or to some other dive locations worldwide locally that we like to do specific teaching of research at. Very cool. And and we are so fortunate that there there's that big marine reserve that is protecting that kelp forest just offshore of La Jolla and very close to Scripps Oceanography. So I know that you guys do a lot of work in that marine reserve as well. So that's super cool. Let's see, um, TK, Angela is asking on behalf of TK, wants to know what kind of animals do you scuba dive with? Well, all kinds of animals that are in the ocean. Um, some of my favorite are the giant black sea bass. We do see them locally and we get lucky enough to see them under the pier. Um, not in juvenile form, but adult form during the dive season. It's really neat. That's um, so cool. Under the pier, actually, like right here, you will get horn sharks, you'll get bat rays, you'll get round rays. Um, you'll actually get little pipe fish sometimes that come through that like to sit near the things that sit straight up. Because remember, they're related to seahorses, but they're straight instead of curved like seahorses are. Oh, wow. Yeah. How cool. Uh, have you ever seen an animal diving here in La Jolla that you were super stoked? Like you never thought you would see one of these creatures and then you saw one and it was like, <gasps> wow. I got to see a giant ocean sunfish underwater. Whoa. I have wow. never ever seen an ocean sunfish underwater while diving. I've only ever seen them on the surface. <laughs> they are really amazing creatures. Um, for anyone wondering, an ocean sunfish, I'm pretty sure they are actually the heaviest bony fish in the ocean. And there are a couple of different types. And they have a very funny body. And actually, Melissa, you can tell me if this is correct. They're kind of shaped like, I don't know. I can't do the dive signal for it. They have a fin up top and then they have the same fin on the bottom. Yeah, they look like a fish that only has a gigantic head and then fin that goes up and a fin that goes down. They are really cool. Um, and I've seen them from our whale watching boat before, but I've not seen them. Oh, here we go. We got a photo pulled up for you. Ah, oh, they're so cool. The crazy um, thing about being the heaviest bony fish in the sea is they eat moon jellies, which are only about four calories each. Oh, my gosh. That's talk about a crazy diet for such a big creature, but living in the open ocean, sometimes there's not a ton of food or it's not very easy to find when they're swimming around in the open ocean. So they got to eat what they can get. And luckily jellies are one of the few things that are usually pretty abundant. Um, I'm pretty sure that they also can't close their mouth all the way. <laughs> go around sucking up jellies. It's like sucking jello through a straw. <laughs> Delicious. <laughs> Let's see, we have another question coming in. Um, uh, looks like uh, Vian wants to know if you have ever seen a shark underwater. I have seen a shark underwater. I have seen taupe sharks underwater. Uh, locally, unfortunately, some of them are called uh, soup fin sharks, uh, but their real name is taupe shark, T-O-U-P-E. 
They are beautiful. Um, they look kind of funky because they've got these teeth that stick out, so they look menacing. But they only like to eat small fish and other things like that. I have also been lucky to see makos, um, and makos underwater, the local leopard sharks and horn sharks and swell sharks underwater, um, which have been really neat. <laughs> that is really cool. And it's always exciting to see, see any sharks underwater, in my opinion. It's so fun. Um, I love this picture uh, that we just pulled up here. There's two, one of you uh, diving in the ocean and one of you diving in our giant kelp forest. But I love that you can see that you're smiling through your regulator. <laughs> what are you doing in this fun picture, Mel? Um, well, the picture of me in our exhibit was actually the first dive I did in our exhibit when I got the oh, job. Really? So cool. that was me excited for being in the kelp tank for the first time here at Birch Aquarium. Um, the larger picture of me carrying what looks like a big camera system, I was lucky enough to be able to go out and do research with the coral mosaicing team here at Scripps that is going around. It's called the 100 Island Challenge. They're going around to 100 islands, and they're taking pictures of all the coral reefs on those islands to understand the health of the coral reefs and figure out what the best products are moving forward. And so I was lucky enough to go to Maui and help do research there for a few weeks and mosaic all of those corals. That is so cool. And for anyone who has been to Birch Aquarium, we have a whole exhibit that is called Research in Action, the 100 Island Challenge. And it's showcasing that Scripps Oceanography research that Melissa got to help with. And um, Mel, can you tell us a little bit more about what is that mosaicing that you're talking about? I know they're using some really fancy underwater cameras that they actually test in our exhibit before going out into the field because you don't want to get to Maui and then realize your underwater camera doesn't work. So can you tell us more about what is that mosaic process that, that they're doing or that imaging? Well, like you said, it is a very fancy process. So I'll do my very best as a marine biologist to uh, describe it. But um, from my understanding, what we're doing is we're taking this camera system and we're taking multiple, multiple, multiple pictures of areas. And then they're taking all of those pictures that we're taking, um, which is like hundreds of pictures per area of coral reefs that we're mosaicing. And the mosaic is a compilation of all of those pictures now put together so they can see the whole area of what that coral reef looks like in almost like a 3D form. So they understand what things are looking like on the surface, where there might be unhealthy areas and where there might be healthy areas and what might be projected for moving forward. So we went to multiple different sites and did all of these photos at all those different sites. And then the scientists had to take the time after that to upload all of those photos and then put all of those photos into the proper order. So like Caitlin said, before we went all the way to the island, here in that research and action tank, those cameras were brought in and we were using them on the corals here in the exhibit so that they could test the camera and make sure it was gonna work, test the process and make sure they were gonna be able to put all the mosaic pictures together properly. And then once everything was good to go, we decided to head out in the field and do all that research there. That's really cool. And there's so many steps that have to be taken by the scientists, by, by everybody before you go on one of these research expeditions, because it's not, not necessarily often, and it can be very expensive for the scientists to go out to some of these more remote locations to do their research. So preparing ahead of time, like you guys did in our exhibit, really makes a huge difference for when, when everybody gets out into the field and you're ready to go, a well-oiled machine, hopefully. <laughs> I know that the 100 Island Challenge has been really important because it helps provide a baseline uh, or a place to start to understand what's going on in many of the reefs around the world. Because to under understand how a reef or any habitat is changing, you have to have a really good idea of what is there from the start. So by having these really high resolution images, the scientists are able to understand, okay, this is what's there. And then maybe the next year or a few years later, they can say how the reef has changed by going back and doing another scan. So they're so high resolution that often they can see how much a coral has grown or what corals have passed away over that time when they go back to the locations. That is such a cool research program. And it's so cool that you got to, to head out and explore with those script scientists. Very lucky. So cool. Um, so I think we're going to transition into talking a little bit more about a place that's closer to home, haha, <laughs> quite close to you here at the aquarium right now. Who, who is this person in this photo feeding that very large fish? <laughs> um, yes, that is me. I think uh, it is. Yeah. Um, a few weeks ago. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry if my Wi Fi is being a little funny right now, but <laughs> no worries. <laughs> so, so um, I know we've been getting a ton of questions about a lot of the animals that we see in our kelp forest. So um, since Melissa is one of the people that dives not only in our kelp forest exhibit, but in giant kelp forest offshore, I think it might be a few of the questions coming in. So let me see. Tony has a question or a comment that says, I know that sea urchins eat kelp. Do I, I know that too? Yes, sea urchins do eat kelp. And Melissa, have you seen the urchins out in the wild before eating the kelp? I have seen the urchins out in the wild before. Um, I've actually been to an urchin barren, which is an area where the sea urchins have eaten all of the kelp and there is no longer kelp growing in that area. Oh man, that sounds like the habitat might have been a little out of balance there. Um, those sea urchin barrens, like Melissa was saying, usually a kelp forest is a true forest of, of kelp, of that algae that we have. You can actually see it right at the end of that mackerel that Melissa is about to feed the sea bass in that picture. That is some giant kelp. Melissa, how big can giant kelp get? Oh, giant kelp can grow two feet per day if it has the proper um, nutrients, sunlight, water, temperature that it needs. So if it longs it gets its proper, it can go two feet a day as high as it needs to grow. Yeah, and, and usually in, in local waters, the kelp can be about 100 feet tall if it's in water that deep, but much deeper than that, it, the it's not getting enough light. So it needs to be able to grow because it does photosynthesis just like a plant. It likes Very to be cool. 70 feet at the best depth. However, it can grow a lot taller than 60 to 70 feet. Yeah, really cool. Uh, let's see, we had another question. Um, Angela is reaching out and TK wants to know if you ever use an underwater camera. I know you use that fancy scanning camera um, that, that the scientists use, but do you ever use like smaller cameras like a GoPro or underwater cameras uh, at the aquarium? Yeah, here locally, obviously a camera that big wouldn't always work so well in some of the smaller exhibits we have. So we do usually use a GoPro. And I use a GoPro quite often to just get a better idea of what I'm looking at. Sometimes you can really be looking at something under, this, under the water, but water does a lot of funky things to our vision. It makes things seem bigger, it makes things seem smaller or further away. So taking photos of it and being able to look at it later helps to really get an understanding of what you did see. And a lot of times too, things change so often in the tank, like right now it's Garibaldi breeding season. And the Garibaldi nests are getting eggs some days, not getting eggs other days. And for us to know when the best time to collect those eggs are, we have to keep up with what the transitions are going. So taking GoPro footage of that and keeping an eye on it really helps us know when the best time to collect is. That's really cool. And I know that on our, I believe, I think we have a video on our Instagram, our IGTV, um, and maybe a few other places. We have uh, Vince, who is another one of our aquarists, collecting some of those Garibaldi eggs from our giant kelp forest exhibit. And so I know we've had questions before. People want to know, well, why can't we just leave the eggs in the exhibit for them to hatch? Well, the thing is, this is a really huge exhibit, and it's not designed for baby Garibaldi, which are teeny tiny when they hatch out. Melissa, how big is a baby Garibaldi when it hatches out of its egg? Um, Have you seen them that small? You can see them with your bare eye, but I'd say maybe a couple of millimeters. Uh, the oh, really cool thing about it is we use a turkey baster and like a plastic water bottle to go down and collect them as you guys probably saw in that video. And if we collected a proper uh, growth rate, they will start hatching 10 minutes after we get out of the water. So wow. it's really neat. You can hold up this water bottle and all of a sudden you see these teeny tiny little things start swimming around in there and you're just like, ah! <laughs> How cute! Yeah. How cute! And I know that uh, your team uh, has actually grown up a few of those baby Garibaldis and we do or did have some on display in, in that nursery exhibit. So that's super cool. It's still in there waiting for friends to come back to the world. I know. We're, so we're not sure when we're going to open up to the public yet, but hopefully... He'll be there waiting. Eventually, yes. But thankfully, Melissa and the rest of the Aquarius team are there uh, helping, helping take care of those creatures. Um, so we have kind of a, a fun question from Ben. Um, he wants to know, have you ever gotten caught in the kelp? 
like wrapped up in the kelp? And if so, how do you get untangled from the kelp? I think that's a good question because I've seen you guys placing kelp in the exhibit and it looks super tangly. Kelp, as you can see, has a lot of different spindles and, and blades or leaves or parts that come off and just kind of go everywhere. So it is very, very easy to get caught in the kelp. And I cannot pretend that I've never been caught in the kelp before. It's happened quite often. Um, when you do get caught in the kelp, the first thing to do is try not to Tasmanian devil. Try not to freak out and start going crazy. I hope <laughs> that yeah. And you kind of calm down and you take a second to realize that you are caught. And hopefully your buddy is paying attention and they've recognized that too. A buddy can help you untangle yourself. But if a buddy is not close enough to you, you have a couple of options. If you can reach it, you obviously can pull it right off of you. However, every scuba diver should always dive with a dive knife as a tool. It is not a knife to stabby stabby anything. It usually has a blunt tip on it that doesn't allow you to stab anything. But it has a like hook part of it that helps to get rid of fishing line. If you were to find fishing line underwater and that hook part, works really well for helping if you get caught in the club as well. Definitely. And I could see that could be kind of a scary moment if you're tangled up in the kelp. So that's why that training that Melissa does as a as a dive instructor for the scientific diving class and beyond is really important to help people calm down and know what to do. Um, Angela wants to, or TK on behalf, Angela is asking on behalf of TK, uh, do you have a dive knife, Melissa? I do have a dive knife and I use it quite often, not just for releasing myself from being tangled, but I use it as a tool to remove invasive allergies or other things that I do not want in our exhibits or in areas that need to go. Yeah, that's a that's a great point is that um, in many places in our ocean world, there are invasive species or animals that got or plants or algae or any sort of thing that gets moved from one location to another, usually by people. And it's not supposed to live there. So, for example, we might have some invasive algae from the Mediterranean, which is we're not supposed to be in San Diego, but they end up here. So that's something that I know Melissa and the team is often doing within our giant kelp forest is removing some of that algae that starts to grow that maybe isn't supposed to be there. Yeah, that's hard work. <laughs> um, before we move on to talking a little bit more about that really cool uh, endangered giant black sea bass, Endangered Species Day is coming up on Monday, so I'm excited to talk about her. Um, but we had a few questions. Oh my gosh, wait, first I have to say, Caroline says kelp is like devil's snare from Harry Potter. <laughs> hey, okay. And yes, and um, thank you for your support. Thank you. <laughs> um, we had a few questions uh, that were about marine mammals. We had a few people um, comment asking if you have ever seen, and I'm going to add or heard, whales or dolphins when you've been scuba diving. I have heard uh, dolphins, at least. I'm not sure about whales, but I've definitely heard of dolphins while scuba diving. Um, I've not seen them underwater, but the noises they make, the clicks, and sometimes the calls they make are very loud, and getting out of that location actually has been what I've done in the past when I've heard those loud clicks. Definitely, and, and just so everybody knows, uh, whales and dolphins are protected by the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So if you ever happen to be snorkeling or swimming or scuba diving, uh, you have to give them plenty of space. You're not allowed to get within uh, 100 yards or about 300 feet of those animals unless they decide to approach you. So sometimes we hear about snorkelers or surfers here in, in La Jolla, and they'll say, oh, I was, I was surfing and the dolphins came by. That's okay, because the dolphins chose to come by, by them. But if you're ever out there in a boat and you see whales or dolphins in the distance, you can't go up right next to them because that's against the law. So uh -huh. just want to make that point. People get so excited, sometimes they forget. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit, oh, here's our giant kelp forest uh, exhibit. Melissa, can you tell us how this compares to diving in, in the wild giant kelp forest in the marine reserve just off of La Jolla? Yeah, I mean, obviously this is actually what we're trying to mimic here in this display. We're trying to show what it should look like when the kelp forests are healthy. Um, during certain times of the year, especially one like this, the kelp forest can look a lot like this out when you go just right here off the protected MPA. Um, Hopefully during certain times it is a lot thicker. Uh, you do have to worry a lot more about entanglement in the kelp because it is very thick. As well as where your buddy is. You want to make sure that you and your buddy are in well 
visual contact of each other and you don't really lose sight when you go through that forest. Um, yeah, and as most of you know, we've gone through some El Nino years and some years where we have lost a majority of the kelp that has been out there. So our tanks have also been pretty sparse compared to what the oceans look like. So a lot of the times, what you see in our kelp tank should mimic pretty closely what it's looking like off the coast because we do go and collect this kelp from the areas right here. And so what we do have that's available will then be in our tank. And if we don't have it to be available, you'll know that because the ocean has nothing to give us. I know that um, we talked about the special permits that you guys have to have in order to be go out and collect that giant kelp. Um, so Birch Aquarium, we have to apply for a special permit that allows us to go out and collect a certain amount of kelp um, each year or each duration of our permit. And that includes the entire kelp organism sometimes, but then I know Melissa, your team also sometimes just kind of cuts off the top of the kelp, but luckily it grows two feet. So within a few days, it's back. Exactly. And that's kind of, well, not ex kind of, it's exactly what that permit's trying to do. Like Caitlin said, we have a certain amount of number that we can collect a year of hold fast whole plants from the bottom. And for those of you who aren't really sure what a hold fast is, kelp is like a plant. However, you can tell it's not a plant. It doesn't root into the ground like plants do to suck up nutrients. So what you see rooted on the ground is literally what it's called a hold fast. It's only there to hold the kelp to the ground. So when we do go to collect that, we will actually cut parts of that hold fast off and take that entire kelp plant back to the aquarium. Growing off of that hold fast are stipes, which you can look at as a stem of a regular plant. And then unlike regular plants, these have what are called air bladders. So on the end of each blade or leaf that photosynthesizes, you have an air bladder filled with a type of gas that allows this plant to rise up to the surface to be able to photosynthesize. So yeah. I'm saying, yeah, we have a small amount that we can take from the bottom, but since it grows so fast, we can supplement quite often with just surface clippings. Very cool, very cool. And and we are very fortunate to be close enough to the ocean to have access to that sort of thing for our animals because at Birch Aquarium, we're not only using the giant kelp within the exhibits, it's also an important food for animals like our sea urchins or abalones and some of the invertebrates like that. Um, now, I think our next picture <laughs> is one of everybody's favorite animals at the aquarium. And I know that when we have the kelp cam running, everybody always asks about this particular fish. Melissa, can you tell us what is this cool fish and maybe tell us a little, a little bit about her? So this is our giant black sea bass. And as Kaylin has mentioned before, she is a protected species. Um, she particularly has lived a majority of her life here. So she was uh, acquired from the Cabrillo Aquarium up north in San Pedro back in 1992. Um, so she was brought in then, and from then she's lived the rest of her life here in our kelp forest. And she owns that kelp forest. It is her home. <laughs> Ago, we introduce, yeah, we tried to introduce a, a companion and she did not take too well to the companion. So that is fine. They are quite territorial at times when it's not breeding season. So giving her her space and recognizing that, you know, she is the boss of that tank. It's really cool. And and giant black sea bass, they can get huge. Our girl is, is quite large. She's more than 300 pounds. We've been saying she's like 300 to 350. Does that seem about right? I would give her take on her off season. So black sea bass actually go on a fasting um, during the season or during the time that they should be breeding. So there's a time of the year that she does not eat from us at all. And she is kind of losing some weight and creating eggs and doing with stuff. So during the end of that season, she is about probably 275 to 300 pounds. Um, after breeding season, she gets back on food pretty heavily. And so by then, she's kind of getting that weight back up. Uh, working on Catalina, I often would see 500 plus pound giant black sea bass swimming in schools often around in the kelp forest. That's so amazing. I know that that around Catalina Island and the Channel Islands, uh, there are protected areas there. There's a national park that's uh, in that area as well as marine reserves. So it gives these endangered giant black sea bass a safe haven where they're not getting caught by uh, fishermen, which is not allowed because they're endangered. But sometimes they run into problems with accidental capture or accidental entanglement 
which is still a big problem for them. Um, Melissa, have you ever seen a giant black sea bass? I think you said it, but you've seen them here in La Jolla also, correct? Yeah, I've seen them quite often in the kelp forest. Um, they're beautiful, but I think my favorite time is when I get to spot them under the pier because usually as adults, giant black sea bass like to live in the kelp forest. That's where they like to shelter, they find their main food sources, but as juveniles, they live their life over sandy bottoms. So it's always interesting when you see an adult coming out to where the juveniles would be and it's, yeah. How cool, that must be, is it ever a little intimidating to be in the water with a fish that's way bigger than you? I mean, especially when you're not expecting it. You come around a kelp plant or you come around somewhere and there's all of a sudden a 300, 400 pound fish and you're just like, whoa, you know, it's still startling. But they're such gentle giants. They just kind of sit there and stare at you and you're like, what? That's really cool. Now I'm gonna see if I can jump back to the photo where you're feeding the giant black sea bass because um, we've had questions before. People want to know how do they how do they eat? No, how do they eat? So um, I know that they can kind of like suck their food in and and get it in there. Do they have big teeth or how do they get their food? Exactly. So yeah, they do not have teeth. They don't take bites of things or bite things off. They actually like a grouper, like a bass, suction their whole piece of food in. So the size of food that we have to give her has to be a pretty right size for her. And she, being the diva that she is, will decide not to eat certain food if it's too big or sometimes if it's too frozen. There's been times where she's taken in a, like taken a piece completely in and then spit it out because <laughs> it's not what she's wanting it and it's too frozen. So she definitely takes in a whole mackerel at a time. and. As you notice, it's head first. She likes to take them head first because mackerel do have some spines on them. And there's been some times we have forgotten to cut the spines off. And she's aware of that as sucking something in straight in without having any kind of protection. So as yeah. you can see there, all I'm doing is trying to get things set up for her. And then when she's ready, she just opens her mouth and creates that suction and that fish is gone. That's really cool. I've been um, it before to have her take me up to my elbow. Oh! <laughs> Talk about having to be calm in the moment. You don't, you just sit there and wait and then she just spits you back out like she does the piece of fish she doesn't want. <laughs> That's really funny. I mean, funny afterwards, but in the moment I could see that being a little nerve wracking. Don't panic, don't panic, don't panic. Don't panic. <laughs> um, and if anyone has been to Birch Aquarium, you might've seen uh, our Kelp Forest dive shows um, where we have people like Melissa or some of our diving volunteers who will come in and feed those animals. Um, I we have a question here from I am Andy Chang. Um, what are some of the most difficult or hardest challenges when taking care of the animals in this exhibit? It seems like getting your arm inhaled by a giant black sea bass could be challenging, but is that one of the biggest challenges? What? How is it taking care of this exhibit? I think for me personally, the biggest challenge is treating the animals if they have any injuries at any time. Um, it is a pretty well-established community and they are pretty good to each other, but every so often there has other fights break out or it's mating season or something might happen where wounds do appear and we do have to, we do take care of them and treat them. So times it's very difficult to catch a fish out of the tank, especially if it's not very wounded. Um, so that's hard because you're stressing yourself out and you're stressing out animals in the tank. Um, also with her specifically, the giant black sea bass, Anytime we have to give her medication, just like I said, she knows. So there was a while back where she had a small, um, just a small wound that she got from scratching herself and we needed to give her some antibiotics. And it was, I think four or five different ways of trying to get the antibiotics into her food before she was willing and able to take up her full dosage of medication. Man, that sounds really challenging. I know how hard it is to even get your dog or cat to take their medicine. So I can't even imagine for, for a giant black sea bass. And I think that that points to another part of your job as, as part of our Aquarius team, where when the vets are not present, we do have an amazing vet team that we work with. Uh, they're also affiliated with UC San Diego, and they are a team of vets who also specialize in underwater creatures. I think a lot of times people assume that you're if you're a veterinarian you only deal with fuzzy things but you know scaly things need love too um and so when the vets are not at the aquarium the aquarist team and people like melissa are in charge of of being the vet essentially and taking care of these creatures is that something that is challenging 
It is. And, and honestly, it's part of our everyday job. Every day that we show up here, we do what we call rounds, um, where we spend time every day at all, each and every one of our exhibits watching the animals, watching their behaviors, seeing how things are looking, and just making sure that the health of these animals are looking good. Um, when we are finding unhealthy animals, you know, it's also coming up with a proper treatment moving forward is difficult because they can't tell you what's wrong with them and they can't really tell you where it hurts most. So being aware of what's going on and having a clean, clear idea of how to treat these animals and what best to use is also something to spend a lot of time researching and being sure about before you move forward. Definitely. That's really yeah. important. Um, now, guys, we only have a few more minutes uh, for our chat with Melissa. This one went really fast I feel questions I just want to show this very cool baby creature and maybe you guys commit this big mama to memory this big giant black sea bass because does that look like this little fish I don't know but Melissa can you tell us what is this cute little fish that we have at birch Aquarium right now? That is a juvenile giant black sea bass. Um, They're so cute. So cute. Um, something really, really, really cool for um, not only the aquarium industry, but giant black sea bass in general is this year, there was an accidental mating up in some aquariums at the Aquarium of the Pacific and Cabrillo Aquarium, where giant black sea bass mated and successfully were able to raise over 200 giant black sea bass babies. And the really neat so amazing is they 200 of them were released into the wild this year as well as a lot of the aquariums around uh, the industry in the world were able to acquire some of these which is awesome because they were not collected out of the wild they are all proper genetics and they were captive bred and captive raised and now we can help with the population in the wild that's so amazing now at, at birch aquarium we do not have permits to release animals back into the wild um however other institutions, sorry if you can hear my dogs crying in the back, <laughs> they're playing. Um, other institutions which are part of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, which we are a part of, there's a very rigorous process to be a member of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And what we do as a team of many, many different institutions is to work together to help try to save and get these endangered species like the giant black sea bass to reproduce in captivity. So the fact that our colleagues were able to do this is a huge success for everyone. So we are feel really fortunate to have this baby giant black sea bass and it is so cute. <laughs> They're growing so fast though. Oh man, I can only imagine when when uh, we came to work from home, I know you're at the aquarium, but um, when I left the aquarium to work from home, I feel like the one we had on display was about this big maybe? How big is it now? Big now. Oh, I'm just joking. She's, I feel like that as the mom, like seeing her every day, she just keeps growing and growing. And the thing I'm a little worried about is that when everyone is able to come back that we won't have her in the nursery display anymore. I am true. hoping by then she'll be big enough that she can go into a couple of other displays so she still will be on display, but it'll be a very long time before she is big enough to go into the kelp pool. Definitely, definitely. Um, we have a follow-up question that, that involves the sea bass from uh, Shweta wants to know, how long is our adult giant black sea bass, maybe compared to this little baby we have right now? It's been a very long time since we have um, actually measured the length of our adult giant black sea bass, but I would give it that she's probably at least four, getting upwards of four feet in length total from tip to nose. Um, our juvenile one, I did actually measure when we first got when we first got her in, and she was four inches long. Whoa, um, we decided to do a training or a trading of, of tanks. We'll get some more measurements on them, and as of now, looking at her from tip to tail, she's probably getting closer to I'd say five to six inches. That's really cool. So remind us again, um, Timothy is asking on behalf of Levi, who wants to know how how old is the baby giant black sea bass? Um, the one that we have currently that we got, I believe they were born a few months ago, right? Yeah, I think she's eight months old at this point. Um, once they finally decided that they were able to be, re to be released and to be given to other institutions, there was a lot um, to do with this protected species to decide what was going to happen with all the juveniles that were born.
Right, right. And it's a team of scientists, researchers, conservationists, aquarists. It's not just one person making this decision. It's it's a conservation team and an effort from, from everyone to try to make the best decision for this. Um, as we're wrapping up, I think we have maybe one or two more questions um, that we might ask. But I just wanted to say thank you to all the little TK students from Thoroughgood Marshall who, who listened to us today. I'm really glad that you guys were able to tune in. Um, and I think the last question we're going to answer right now is from Ben, and he wants to know, why does the juvenile fish look different than the adult? And do other fish do this? That's a really great question. That is a really great question, Ben. Thank you. Um, so one of the reasons why baby fish look different from adult fish is for protection. Um, another really cool protected local fish is our baby Garibaldi. Um, baby Garibaldi, when they're little, have neon blue spots on them. And those neon blue spots are supposed to try to give predators an idea that these fish are poisonous and these uh, other animals shouldn't eat them. So juveniles usually look a lot different than their adults for some kind of camouflage to be able to fit in or to warn others to swim away. Uh, this yeah. one in particular has some really, really big fins. So it's kind of like having a puppy that's going to grow into a very big dog where the puppy is so cute, but its paws are like this big. And it's kind of similar with this fish. It's so cute and little, but its fins are like this big. And it's, <laughs> you know that it's going to be a very big fish as it gets older. As you may not have seen in the picture that Caitlin had up of the face on picture of the black sea bass, they do continue to have those spots throughout their life. And those I'm hard to see in this one, but yeah. So yeah, those spots are actually used to help identify what species or what individual, I'm sorry, what individual they're seeing when they're going out and tracking individual giant black sea bass at times. So Very cool. So just like people might use the dorsal fin of a dolphin for identification shots or the flukes of a whale to bring it back to mammals, um, researchers also use the spot patterns on fish. And also they use this ID technique for many different creatures. I know that our sea dragons also have identification uh, information based on their spot patterns and the patterns of their appendages. So I know a lot of people think about mammals when it comes to that, but it's really important for fish also. All right, guys, it looks like we are just about on the end of our time. Thank you so much to everybody who participated today and especially thank you to Melissa. This was super fun and really interesting to learn about your unique career and the really neat things that you do here at Birch Aquarium. Uh, I also wanna say thank you to Qualcomm again. Thank you to the Qualcomm families for tuning in and for your support of Birch Aquarium during this very unusual time. Um, uh, we have another live event on Thursday afternoon, 2 o'clock Pacific time. So I hope you guys are able to tune in. And thank you again, Melissa. And we'll see you guys next time. All right, bye, bye, bye. Hey, everybody.